Hello everyone. Um, my name is Eleanor Blank. I'm the founder of Crypto Canal. Thank you so much, PG, for the clicker and for having me here today. Who here has ever used a mixer? Just raise your hand. Who is familiar with the Tornado Cash case? Okay. Let's say that this one is for posterity and also for you guys here today. I felt a little bit torn, obviously, going through this, this case. I lived it pretty personally. In short, today I'm going to cover what is Tornado Cash, the legal arguments, and why I believe that privacy is a public good and that we should not treat our builders as criminals. I'm going to, it's going to be like an interesting presentation as I'm trying to resume what's going on. And there's a lot of different actors and there's legal implications. But basically, Tornado Cash is a decentralized, non custodian smart contract mixer. This was a first. We never had a product of such, something that worked automatically and gave privacy to, to all. Users, depending on how tech savvy, they are, can directly connect to the UI or directly to the smart contract. And you can see that this is a product that was definitely used and needed as over the years and since its inception, uh, more than seven billion worth of ETH have gone through Tornado Cash. It also had something, so the, the platform worked, it obviously uh, answered a solution and was needed by a lot of people. And on top of it, it had a token. So the Torn token um, had two purpose. It was to be used in the Trino to Cash DAO for govern governance purpose. And that is something we like to see. We like to see tokens that can be used and have utility. And the th second thing that it was used for was to be able to run relayers. Or let's say that the more you staked, the higher the chances that your relayer would be used uh, while tokens would go through Tornado Cash. So I know that a lot of you here have either used it or know what it is, but just for, for the sake of posterity, once again, Tornado Cash enabled you to basically anonymize your funds and give you privacy once again, because this is something that we don't have in crypto right now. Um, of course, there's different projects, different blockchain, but on the Ethereum blockchain, um, you would send your assets from wallet A to wallet B. Um, that's completely to be seen for the rest of the world. And if you want to anonymize, you could send your assets from wallet A to the pool, wait a little bit. The longer you would wait, the better. And then retrieve them a few days later, and by therefore breaking that link between those two wallets. And that, was, that is a very useful feature. And you'll see that although today I'm going to talk about the case and the different people that are, well, currently facing legal battles and in different jurisdictions, it's still useful today and it's still running and people can still use it. So I know this looks a bit crazy and everybody's going to tell you never make a slide with so much text, but there's a lot going on. On the left side, you have everything that's happening in the Netherlands. So. What happened last year, and we had to start knowing all these people, but the FIAD, um, which is the Fiscal Information Investigation Service and responsible for investigating financial crimes in the Netherlands, charged Alexei Peretsev and arrested him. For then nine months, or 260 days, Alexei was in jail with no charges and only three pro forma hearings, which were yeah, bureaucratic nightmares for him, for everyone, for his, for his loved ones as well. And basically, there was a lot of opacity in the case and we didn't know what was going on. And at the same time, we kept wondering what's happening in the US. At that time, when he got arrested, the Axie Infinity 
Ronin bridge hack, which is, we get several hacks in crypto, but this one was really what was the, the one too many, I guess, for this case. Happened, and OFAC sanctioned the Tornado Cash in the US, and the OFAC is the Office of Foreign Asset Control, and they are the equivalent of the fiat for the United States. And it took them almost a year, almost, to charge and arrest the other two founders of Tornado Cash, Roman Storm and Roman Semenov. Alexei right now is allowed to be in the Netherlands. He's not under house arrest. Um, we had the last pro from my hearing very recently. He is under conditional uh, arrest and is awaiting trial in the Netherlands, um, which will happen in, on the 26th and 27th of March next year. Roman Storm was arrested uh, two months ago and was arrested uh, and is now under house arrest in the USA uh, under a two million bond. Roman Semenov was charged with the same, uh, yeah, from the same indictment from Roman Storm, um, but has not been arrested for now. And something really interesting to see is that just before Roman uh, Storm and Roman Semenov were charged and Storm arrested. A Coinbase lawsuit uh, on the 17th of August that was trying basically to question even the validity of OFAC coming after Tornado Cash was rejected. This lawsuit, I believe, is, well, this is all, I'm just, how do you say this? I'm not sure of what I'm saying right now, but I feel like this had to happen so that they could arrest both of them. Because this case basically was arguing that OFAC could not have any jurisdiction over Tornado Cash, over a smart contract, and over a DAO. This lawsuit has created precedent to say that even though you consider the entity that you're working in as a DAO, it doesn't protect you. It doesn't mean that it's not a legal entity. It doesn't mean that they cannot come after you. They basically did the shortcut and said, well, you have a DAO, fine. Call yourself a decentralized autonomous organization. You're like a, you still have some form of stakeholders. With your governance, with the token that you're using, it doesn't protect you. And I think this was really important. The second thing is that OFAC sanctioned not Alexei or Roman, Storm or Roman Semenov, they sanctioned the smart contract, the token contract of Tornado Cash. And that was a precedent that Coinbase and the other people that were part of this lawsuit were contesting. This is, you're out of your boundaries. This is not something you should be, uh, let, you know, pronouncing yourself for or against. So, as you can see, a lot of actors, one Dutch side, one American side, they are, they do have connections, obviously. And I was, since I live in the Netherlands and I followed this one and I run a community, obviously we were trying to support Alexia as much as possible, but now we need to connect and make bridges also with what's happening in the United States. Next slide. So, what's happening? What, what is now the case about? And keep in mind that for the first nine months of all this happening, we didn't really know what the charges were. We could only guess, but we didn't know exactly, especially in the Netherlands where the system is even more opaque than in the US, where at least they had to publish an indictment recently. So the defense, what have we heard? What are the arguments? The first one was, you know, code is free speech. How can you arrest Alexei? He's not guilty. You, we slowly saw that the case was going to be built around something a bit different. But indeed, software development um, has been established and protected as free speech since the 1990s in the United States. And these are legal precedents that are really important to defend and protect. And I think a lot of you here uh, can benefit. <laughs> and we are really the children of these lawsuits that happened in the 90s. Uh, which made sure that basically software development was protected. The second thing, and these two points, I guess, were revoked by that 
uh, Coinbase lawsuit, but smart contracts aren't private property of Tornado Cash. I heard the lawyers saying this several times, where are they being, they, they never claimed private property, this is open source, etc. They are not really listening to that. Another argument, as I mentioned, Tornado Cash is not an entity and cannot be prosecuted by OFAC. Again, that point has been dismissed recently. And something that Alexis' lawyer has been repeating on it again and again, Tornado Cash is a public tool bringing privacy to all. This is not um, a for-profit uh, tool. This is something that was for all, enabling every user in the world to access the UI and connect and use this mixer. They also did implement a compliance tool. This is a pretty important, and I'll be going back to it a bit later. But this compliance tool means that you as a user, if you were to bring your assets from Tornado Cash back to a centralized exchange, and they would ask for the source of these funds, you could actually have a compliance tool report that you would use yourself, and then it would allow you to still go back to a centralized exchange with funds brought from Tornado Cash. Uh, but this was very case by case, and this is something that all users could use. It is not considered a KYC AML tool. It's really a ad hoc optionality for users uh, that, have, that need to move funds from Tornado Cash to centralized exchange. And finally, and you'd think that this is like the most obvious point, but somehow it's also the hardest to make, uh, you cannot prosecute the makers for the crime of the users. And this is something which is getting really muddy, where basically they are accusing every bad actor that had used Trinidad Cash, they are now putting that blame onto the makers. So in the US, you have now three official charges. Conspiracy to commit money laundering, they did not have KYC ML. Conspiracy to operate an unlicensed money transmitting business, they were not registered. Right, they were a DAO. And then conspiracy to violate the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. <laughs> yeah, so this is the part where things got really tricky. And this is what really ticked off OFAC, is when they saw <laughs> those 600 million that were hacked from Axie Infinity go straight to Tornado Cash by the Lazarus Group. That was really the moment where and you can see it in the discussions from the Tornado Cash team where they tried kind of in last measures to make sure that those funds would not uh, go through Tornado Cash, but it was too little, uh, too late. So in the Netherlands, Alexi is charged with laundering money from 36 hacks, equivalent to 500,000 worth of Ethereum. Uh, in the US, it's one billion. So, they don't really care about the how or the how much or the exact, just these big numbers, right? So imagine the headlines, North Korea, crypto, mixers, and it's just poisonous headline, um, which is really hard to speak about and, and, and inform people in an educated manner. Um, a few additional elements, uh, the UI. You have to think about this when you're building these tools Anything that will attach you to the real world can be used later against you. So the UI, the, the tool that enabled sort of normal users that didn't want to interact directly with a smart contract was paid directly with a PepperSec bank account. So now PepperSec, which was working with these developers, that they're tracing back the credit cards. So if you, are, if you facilitated this, by even buying the domain, you are liable for whatever happens on that UI. Also, I know that we see Tornado Cash as a public good, that we see privacy as a human right. It was, it was a for-profit enterprise. This was a for-profit enterprise. Uh, they received 900,000 uh, worth of funding from a VC. That's another point that the prosecution is bringing, is this was not just you know, open code for the world and given for free. This was, there was incentives behind it to make money. And so, in short, the prosecution argues that they benefited from the money laundering, that the torn token was very important in this whole scheme, 
and this is how the team benefited from the money laundering that went through Tornado Cash and did not uh, take sufficient measures to prevent malicious actors like the Lazarus Group to launder money through Tornado Cash. So, I know that I look like a crazy person, you know, and that I'm making all these connections between the prosecution and what happened in the Netherlands, but the next slide is even more chilling. You can see in the indictment, which you can, I don't know if the QR code is good enough for you all, but these are screenshots from the indictment with Telegram, I think. It never says Telegram, but it's from the encrypted messaging app, which I can only assume they're using Telegram, with their direct communication between the team. And that is being used against them today. So as they were building the case, they got access to all their conversations. You can see Storm Semenov asking, would you like, no, it's Storm actually asking, would you like to install KYC on Tornado? He's like, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> no. I'm not saying you should all implement KYC ML. I'm really more on the other side. But you can see that they're using this now for the first count of, uh, in the charges. Second, we should never, even in private chats, talk as if we own Tornado. You can see that they're starting to understand that ownership and who's liable is going to come out. What is the biggest problem? Why are they feeling the heat? Well, we have a UI, and we don't fucking block anything in the front. Anyone and anything could use Tornado Cash, which on some level is great, because you don't want to decide who can and who cannot have privacy. Then you're back to a centralized platform and whitelisting, and it's a whole other pile of mess. But what's going to happen is they're going to try to use this as a defense and say, well, we need to hand over the primary access, and then we can yell that the worker is not the owner. Yeah, that didn't really work. So as you can see, um, they knew that something was going to be off, that something was going to happen. Um, and basically, the, the prosecution is using all these private chats, which we can also discuss the legality of you know, breaking this. But once you're indicted in the US, I guess, away with your privacy. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we're going to be following the case a bit more in the months to come. There's still a lot of question. Um, but in short, I think we need financial privacy for all. We are here at an event, and we'll have several discussions today to, next slide, to discuss privacy, what it means. Oh, no. I knew that I had another slide that I forgot. Have you used the Tornado Cash Compliance tool? Remember, I asked before. You don't have to do this right away. But basically, to support Alexi's upcoming trial in March, we're looking for people that have used the compliance tool that are ready to talk about it, have documentation from it, and yeah, to just basically build a case. Because the prosecution right now is kind of saying, well, you had a compliance tool, but pff, you know, did it, was it really useful? They're basically questioning if the tool was enough. And if a few people would just, yeah, just share what happened and how they used it. And yeah, I, was, I used Tornado Cash, this was great. I didn't want my, I don't know. You don't even have to explain why you needed that privacy. I hate that we're at that part now where we have to justify when we need privacy. Yeah, I don't want my boss to know what I'm doing with my funds at the end of the month, whatever. But if you use Tornado Cash compliance tool and you're ready to share about it publicly in a court case, I know. Basically dox yourself about using the compliance tool and help LXC Peretz of case. That'd be great. You can always DM me or reach me out. And if you wanted to support the case, um, QR code is there. All right, final slide, guys. I know this was a lot, and I know some of you are very familiar with the case, but in short, financial privacy. If we are to create the financial tools of tomorrow, if we are to change how money works, we have to be better than cash, right? We cannot have a, we, I want it cheap, I want it permissionless, I want, it, I want everything, but I also want privacy. 
What type of privacy, on what scale, with what tools, that's up to each individual. But privacy is a fundamental human right to cherish and protect and not take for granted, I would even add. Yes, the implementation and the details matter. Do I have a perfect recipe now to tell you how to build privacy protocols and tools for tomorrow? No. Obviously, the regulations and the way that they are implementing these regulations keeps changing and it creates a lot of uncertainty and doubt. But the details do matter. And maybe if you don't need a token, just don't use it. If, you're, if your platform works and you're solving a problem and it, it's just, just don't add things that you don't need to. Builders are not financial criminals. I know that sounds like, like a crazy statement, but I feel like it has to be said. I think the, the attitude from the outside, and I saw it when I was sitting in these court cases and in these court hearings, were the bad people. You know, they don't understand, we're just all weirdos, and we're just doing crypto weird things, and they don't understand that we're trying to do something different. And it doesn't mean that we're criminals. But we are changing the system, so, you know. Today you're going to hear about Railgun, NIM, privacy pools. I don't think we're going to hear about proof of innocence, but just there's a lot of developments still happening in privacy in the crypto industry. And I look forward to seeing all of these grow, learn, and prosper to give privacy relief for every user out there. And finally, I believe strongly in education to counter all this FUD created by regulators and media and weird things. And we need more education, and we need more events like this one, like ETH Rome, like, like Web3 Privacy and all the new events that they're going to be doing, and ETH Dam. This is the only way we can move forward. Yeah. So, on that note, I would like to have privacy, transparency, and censorship for all. Thank you very much.